In the last presentation, I showed how metacryptography allows us to create more keys, and more keys allows us to create more roles, and more roles allows us to have more control over cryptography, which means more control over the data we're encrypting. So if more keys is better, how about we try less keys? What can we do? What advantage might that have? Hello, I'm Philip Ann Baker, and in this presentation, I'm going to be showing you the use of metacryptography to combine two keys or more keys into one and show how that is really useful. It's used in the mesh for device provisioning, and it also allows for a completely new hardware approach that provides protection against the type of spectre and row hammer attacks that are happening now on CPU systems. Okay, so how does this work? Well, let's review our Diffie-Hellman system. If the private key is x, the public key is e to the x. If the public key is private key is y, the public key is e to the y. So what do we get if we multiply e to the x times e to the y? Well, it's e multiplied by itself x times times e multiplied by itself y times, which is e to the power x plus y. Mod p, of course. but And e to the x plus y, that's also a Diffie-Hellman public key. Isn't that interesting? We've got two public keys here that we've done a mathematical operation on, and we've got a new key. And does that, t you know, what's the private key that corresponds? Well, it's x plus y. What this means is that the person who control, who knows the two private keys can calculate the corresponding private key. And the, any, but anybody who knows the two public keys can also calculate the corresponding pub, public key for the composite. And that's tremendously useful because it means that we can calculate composite private keys from the private components alone, knowing that somebody can now calculate the corresponding public key from the public components alone. Okay, so why do we want to use this? Well, the problem that comes up in traditional public key generation is there is no perfect way to do it. You have two choices. You can either generate your private key pairs, public private key pairs, on the device itself that's going to use them, or you can generate them somewhere else. If you generate them somewhere else, then you've got to get those keys onto the device somehow. So you've got to have a secure channel to get the keys onto the device. You've also got the question of, well, is that device that produces them any more trustworthy than the target device? Not necessarily. So traditionally, we've stuck to generating the keys on the device itself. And as a result, most of the provisioning issues that we've seen are the issues that arise from the keys being generated on the device. And they can be quite serious. Um, I started looking at this type of cryptography, actually, when there was a whole series of problems to do with weak keys. So what was happening there was that somebody was shipping usually an Internet of Things device. It wasn't initialized in the factory. Somebody turns it on, and the first thing it does is to calculate a public-private key pair. And so at this point, it's not got very much randomness in the system because remember here that when we're talking about cryptography, we're not really talking about randomness. We're talking about unguessability. And the two things are different. You know, something that is truly random will be unguessable unless you somehow disclose it to somebody. And something that is unguessable, well, you prefer it to be random, but it doesn't necessarily need to be perfectly random. 
So what we're really looking for here is unguessability. And those devices just didn't start up with enough unguessability. And some of them started up with no unguessability at all. So when we started deploying this um, particular OCSP type technology, we suddenly started to see that there were a large number of public keys that had the same values in the databases. And we suddenly realized, oh, there's a problem here. OK. And, you know, that was the problem that we saw. The much, you know, it's like uh, people saying, well, NSA, sh Bob Snowden showed the NSA was insecure. Bad Bob Snowden. And I'm thinking, yeah, for every one that you know about, there's 10 or more that you didn't. And it's the same here. We could spot the, the devices that generated exactly the same key each time. What we're not seeing is the devices that are initialized using the MAC address of the key of the machine, the date and time, and you know other puny, you know, insecure stuff, uh, which is you know what led to the original Netscape hack. Which I you know I I'll tell that story at some point in this sequence. Okay, so neither is perfect. What if we could do it? in both places at once. So when we bring a device onto a onto Alice's mesh, the device itself either generates or is shipped with a public private key pair. So whatever we generate on the device, we will use it for the purposes of bootstrapping and that only. And then we add in a second private key that comes is generated on the administration device. And this is something that is coming from a completely different system. And the way that the math works out is with the particular set of additional protections that we've done in the protocol, it means that the key that we generate will have at least as much randomness as either of the two contributions. And in fact, it will have the sum of the randomness and guessability of the two contributions. So if we're generating a 448-bit key and we have uh, 200 bits worth of unguessability here and 200 here, then the total amount of unguessability, the work factor, will be 2 to the power 4, 400, which is pretty good. Now, obviously, you can't go above 448 because that's the amount of, uh, you know, that's the size of the key. But um, we get as much unguessability as there is there, bounded only by the key side. So this is really powerful because in addition to solving that weak key problem, it also allows uh, me to elide a whole series of traditional problems in key provisioning, like proof of possession and so on, that turn out to be really quite difficult if you're trying to do them really, really solidly. And it just blows through all of those. Now, it's not perfect, of course. You know, if we have a system where we start off with a weak key and we give another weak key, well, the weak key that we get in the end is going to be only 40 bits. You know? So as with anything else, you know, as with RAID, you can have one drive redundancy, you can have two, you can even have three. But you know, you've only got as much redundancy as you have redundancy. So Two points of failure is better than one, but you've still got, you're still going to be hosed if both fail. You can, however, have as many additional uh, points as you choose, but you'd have to write your own protocols at this point because the mesh only does two. Okay, so cooperative key generation is really useful and has really nice properties and we apply it at multiple layers in the mesh. We apply it to join a device to a personal mesh, 
and then reapply it to join a device to an account. It can also be used to provision application keys. And so one of the side things that, um, one of the things that probably needs to happen with the mesh going forward is to extend, you know, generate additional device keys so that we can use them as the basis for blinding additional keys for OpenPGP, SMIME, SSH, and all that good stuff. So it's powerful, um, and we use it to address the key provisioning problem in the West. It can also be applied to trustworthy hardware. Now, I won't go into what Spectre and Rowhammer are in detail, but they're really two uh, side, you know, they're two incarnations of a much earlier attack that was developed by Paul Kosher, who of course was one of the folk who discovered Spectre. Um, and so basically this set of attacks are called side channel attacks. And what they come from is that if you are doing the same operation on a private key repeatedly, you know, again and again and again, small amounts of information can leak into the rest of the world. And traditionally, the rest of the world was all the stuff that's happening outside the computer system itself. So radiation, power usage, even sound. Audi Shamir's uh, students were able to reverse engineer sound using this. And you know, it is tremendously sophisticated statistical analysis going over the same thing again and again and again and, you know, all that Fourier stuff, yeah. But, you know, it does leak information. And computers are really good at doing things again and again and again. So there are two things that you can do to avoid this problem. One is what was proposed uh, back then, where every time you're going to do a private key operation, instead of, if you provided with e to the a and you try you're applying b to it instead of ca applying b to multiplying you know, calculating the exponent of e to the a to the power b what you do is that you first split b into two you know, split it into x and y and you do a calculation e to the a on x e to the a on y and then you combine the two halves and that's a very powerful technique and we should all be doing it what i would also but you know that's a good way of preventing the side channel attack and it's good against spectra or whatever and the way the reasons it works is that you're no longer doing the same operation repeatedly you choose a different random blinding factor every time you perform the operation okay so that's good but it doesn't address the single biggest cause of keys leaking into the wild. And that is keys being disclosed in backups and keys being uploaded to GitHub. Well, and other file stores. Basically, if you look on GitHub, you can find an enormous number of code signing keys up there and the reason that they're there is because they have to be part of the distribution they, they have to be part on the developer's system in order for them to you know, generate the code and the way that Visual Studio makes it easiest to make use of those keys is to put them in a file that happens to be in your project space most of the time and so what happens is that they just get loaded, uploaded. And there are a whole load that are not sensitive, and then there are some that are actually credentialed with key sign code signing certs. The lovely thing that this provides is that we could now tie the cryptography to the machine itself. And so if this is our chip, Okay, so we've got our chip and the, uh, you know, we have our processing cores and we have our RAM. 
what I'm asking for here is, you know, doesn't need to be even the same size as a regular core. Just an itty bitty little processor only does the math that we need to do elliptic curve, has the key blinding built in as default, and it only has one private key that the device will actually process on. And the only thing that we let the user do is to change that key. You know, we can maybe we add let the user add in an extra salt uh, so they know that the one that Intel or AMD or whoever shipped. And so we have this little crypto processor that has a key that is bound to that device, cannot be exported from that device, and all this is doing is saying that device was part of this cryptograph of a particular cryptographic uh, operation as is evidenced by the fact that the corresponding public key is par a part of whatever public key we end up using. So we can always prove, we can always pro provide an attestation that uh, this operation happened on the device. We do not need uh, to actually, we, we, we can avoid all the traditional trusted computing work trustworthy computing group um, attestation protocols. It can be in the certificate. And so it's in the device, and it just uses a mix-in for any of the cryptography. And the user is assured that their stuff is secure because all the stuff they actually do have this second mix-in that they control. And then if we use this in the, the mesh, we would have three mix-ins now one from the CPU manufacturer, another from the manufacturer of the actual device and a firmware key, and a third one from the mesh, uh, from the mesh administration machine. And that gives us a pretty good way of assuring ourselves that we've not been, you know, not had the thing broken. Okay, so, so let's go to a clean board. Okay, so at this point, we've split one key into two, and we've combined two keys to make one. Which is better? Which do we want to do? Well, the answer in the mesh is, when it comes to crypto, is pretty much always both. Why not both? And so in this bit, I'm gonna show you how we can combine the key combination mechanism I showed you this time with the key splitting uh, technique I showed you last time. So recall that Alice um, is uh, managing a recryption group, uh, group W. Okay, so she has the private key. So the private key is W and the public key is E to the W and Alice uh, and Bob, Doug, Carol, and so on. Well, let's just start off with Carol and Doug. They will get their own, uh, instead of giving them W, they will get, get W of Carol and W minus W of Carol. And one of these goes to the cloud and one of these stays with the user. Okay, so this allows us to split the key for each member of the group. And that gives us dual control over the use of those decryption keys. But if you think about it, we're extending rather a lot of trust in Alice. What if Alice defects? Well, let's have Bob instead. Uh, well, what if Bob defects? What we really want to do is to split W into two halves. One half for Alice and one half for Bob. So that Alice plus Bob's group key equals. And so what we do here is that Alice and Bob both create their own key and they provide their public key contributions. So they publish E to the Alice and E to the Bob. And then e to the w is calculated from those two public keys. And what this gives us is two administrators 
that both have to be involved in order to add or remove somebody from a group. And this is very powerful if you really, really, really need to keep control of the information or have a really strong audit trail. You see, one of the things about security, it's not always about trust. Sometimes it's about protecting your personnel. The reason why it takes two bank employees to open the vault is not that we don't trust either of them. It's because if only one employee can open the vault all by themselves, then that employee or their children or their wife is at risk of being kidnapped, having a gun put to their head to force them to operate, to open the vault. So splitting responsibility, separating of duties is really powerful and we embrace it and support it in the mesh. Or rather we will when we've written a bit more code. So we can use both parts together We've just not got up to that yet. OK, so again, what's the scope of this key combination scheme? Well, we can use it for any Diffie-Hellman type cryptography because the private keys are always going to be of the form A. They're always an integer and we can always add to integers and we can always, there's always some corresponding uh, operation on the public keys. We might need to do a bit more work again if we're doing Montgomery curves point compression gets in the way and we have to do a bit of work behind the scenes that we don't always have to do but it can be done the only real limitation to this comes when we really want to know that we are when we do key escrow or well that when we need to be able to recover the key um, if we use these types of technique Obviously, we've got to be able to recover all the components of the key and, you know, that can come up with some uh, limitations and compl complicates the whole thing. But, you know, it's just the bounds of mathematics. OK, so in this presentation, I've shown you the final section on metacryptography so far. Uh, there's more to come later on, but, you know, these are the two techniques that are embedded deeply into the mesh. In the next presentation, I'm going to be showing you the Uniform Data Fingerprint Scheme. And the reason for that is, here I've been showing you the power of three keys is better than two. Well, in the next one, I'm going to be showing you the power of using no keys at all. Please join me for that. And again, please like Please subscribe. The more subscribers, the more people liking these videos, the better the chance that we can take this somewhere and actually put the cryptography to work and secure the web. Thank you very much.